October 2019, Canada held its 43rd general election. But I'm not here to talk to you about the outcome of the election. I'm here to talk to you about the integrity of that election and specifically the use of fake news. Now, fake news. Hopefully that's the last time I'm going to use that term because although prolifically used, the term fake news isn't that helpful to the conversation. Which is all, a, you know, fake news. The problem we're facing currently is the abundance of false sources and the ease at which external actors can influence what you and I see on our public profiles, fundamentally both shaping and manipulating public opinion. We as voting citizens and those who live in a democratic society should absolutely care about the things that could ruin the integrity of an election or could harm political discourse or more generally could just come between us and the truth. And well, if you don't care about any of those things, you should. So for this video and in the context of the Canadian election, what am I talking about when I use the term information warfare? Well, I'm referring to misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. And with three new terms comes three new definitions. Misinformation is when false information is shared without meaning to cause harm. And disinformation is when false information is shared meaning to cause harm. Whereas malinformation is when genuine information is shared to cause harm. Mostly moving something from the private sphere into the public sphere, or hack and leak. Kind of situation. And the reason why it's important that we make sure we understand all of these terms before we crack into it is because misinformation is something we can all attribute to. Journalists are a big part of the problem too, so in making this video I need to make sure that I am in no way guilty of misinforming you, so that when you go on to share the video, please, with any of your friends, you are in no way guilty of misinforming them, and so on. So we've defined information warfare and mis, dis and mal information, but how are they used? Well, mis, dis and malinformation take place on social media. This could be in the form of something as simple as a meme, or it could be an article that's bolstered by fake bot activity. Authoritarian actors use social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, WhatsApp, TikTok, and countless other vehicles, along with computer-generated bots, hijacked accounts, trolls, and state-run media outlets to spread conspiracy theories and disinformation to target social fissures and essentially push political discourse further and further away from each other. Because how often do you see information warfare targeting the middle? Traditionally, you don't. Dismiss and malinformation feed and feed off of polarization, because that's how you get more shares. It lives on the far left and on the far right. But disinformation isn't a new thing. In fact, information operations have existed probably as long as political discourse has. But what is new is the levels of intensity and the countless opportunities to spread dis, mis, and malinformation broadly, quickly, and cheaply. So going into the election, disinformation and how it might be used was a big topic. The Liberals, Conservatives, and the NDP pledged not to fabricate, use, or spread data or materials that were falsified, doxed, or stolen for propaganda or disinformation purposes. The effort and commitment from party leaders to address and attempt to tackle dismiss and malinformation is undoubtedly a good thing, but was it enough? The pledge focuses on domestic solutions in that it is a promise from the party leaders not to directly engage in this sort of behavior themselves. But what it doesn't address is third party behavior and activity. A very capacity for a citizen to engage with truth is under attack and not just by the powerful. In September 2018, Canada created an election integrity task force made up of officials from the RCMP, Global Affairs Canada, and Canada's two main intelligence agencies. This panel of bureaucrats was tasked with investigating threats to the Canadian election, activated as soon as the election was called. The panel was mainly focused on foreign meddling, and all members would have had to sign off before notifying the public of any important incidents. And no such alarm was raised during this election. Does that mean the global task force was successful in eliminating domestic and foreign interference? Well, no, not entirely. Despite no detection of foreign interference, these laws and oversight bodies didn't stop memes from spreading and a false sex scandal involving Trudeau from entering public discourse. How much any of these things directly affected the vote remains to be seen. But looking into this task force a little more, it's quite difficult to find any transparency with how the panel actually operated. What were they monitoring? How are they monitoring? What metrics were they using? So yes, a report was released recounting the lack of foreign interference, which seems to indicate a measure of success, but how are they determining what was foreign from domestic and what exactly counts as foreign influence? Those are questions that I can't answer for you. We spoke to John Gray of Mention Map Analytics, which is a company that specializes in monitoring inauthentic activity online, to get his perspective on the success, or lack thereof, of these protocols. Do you think it was effective in what it was trying to do? I think efforts definitely ha have been made, but I don't believe that um, asking our uh, political parties to sign a pledge um, really was going to make a material difference. The issues around uh, 
disinformation. You, you know, these aren't going to emanate directly from the political party. This is an issue that is a full spectrum issue. We really have to elevate this conversation that we're having, that this is something more than just something that happens during an election. This is something that happens more than just on Facebook, and it's more than just Twitter bots. It's a way bigger issue than all of those things. Despite all of the preventative tactics put in place this election, the Canadian government still did detect misinformation and disinformation during the election campaign. Just not at a high enough level to compromise the election or for the panel of bureaucrats to alert the public. According to CBC, AstroScreen, which is a UK-based company specialising in astroturfing and finding inauthentic behaviour, did find some low-level activity during the election, but no widespread attempt at foreign meddling was found during the several days that they monitored near the end of the campaign. Much of the questionable activity that Astro Screen saw was centered around information published on the website The Buffalo Chronicle, which is a US-based imposter news site that published several false stories during the election regarding Trudeau. While the stories were debunked, three articles between October 7th and October 19th alleging sex scandals involving Trudeau garnered around 2,900 shares per article. Facebook also played a significant role in spreading the stories. The articles got more than 100,000 interactions on Facebook and were shared across 181 unique Facebook groups and pages. The fact that the story was completely false didn't stop the Conservatives from sending a press report asking, why did Justin Trudeau leave his job at West Point Grey Academy? So it's unclear how much of that online activity was inauthentic or organic. But the story itself that garnered all of those shares and attention was completely false. Do you see a potential problem here with a complete lack of fact-checking on political advertisements? Well, Congresswoman, I think lying is bad. And I think if you were to run an ad that had a lie, that would be bad. So you won't take down lies or you will take down lies? So I think this is just a pretty simple yes or no. I believe that people should be able to see for themselves what politicians that they may or may not vote for So you won't take them down. Moving on. So along with the false sex scandal, there was also a number of hashtags that were trending on Twitter. The one with the most press coverage was the hashtag Trudeau must go. In July, the National Observer reported how bot interference made the hashtag Trudeau must go a trending topic on Canadian Twitter. The discovery was made after an analysis of nearly 32,000 tweets containing the hashtag in just two days raised serious suspicions. Much of the activity surrounding the hashtag was actually tweeted at non-human rates. Many accounts tweeted more than 100 times a day, and over two dozen accounts were created in just 48 hours. The user responsible for the most hashtag Trudeau must go tweets was an account called Canada Proud 10 which managed to tweet the hashtag 119 times before Twitter suspended the account. That's a lot of times. But by looking at just this one hashtag, does that limit our view of the problem? Because the role of imagery and memes also plays a big part in disinformation campaigns, and memetic warfare was rife during this election. Memes are popular for disinformation purposes because they're difficult to attribute, they're easy to consume, easy to share, and they don't require a huge amount of literacy to engage with. Memes with false or contorted information were spread by groups with seemingly patriotic names. Many of these groups were created by internal actors like Canada Proud or its sister groups. The Globe and Mail found that the Manning Centre, an organisation founded by former Reform Party leader Preston Manning, was the driving financial force behind a network of anti-liberal Facebook pages pumping out political messaging and memes during the election campaign. Whilst activity on Facebook and Twitter were the main platforms highlighted by the media, all and any social platforms could have been used to spread mis, dis and malinformation during this election. Platforms like TikTok, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, Pinterest, Reddit, can all be used in mis, dis, and malinformation campaigns, and are far harder to regulate and keep track of. It's unlikely we would ever have a concise, quantifiable idea of how any of those platforms could be used in a mis, dis, or malinformation campaign. It's not necessarily the platform, it's us that are vulnerable. What I really believe when we are talking about what's going on in this space is that it's our brains that are being hacked, our emotions that are being hacked. We have to talk about these issues as a human problem needing a human solution, not a technological problem that needs a technological solution. And this is where I think, again, I come back to is that some of the research that we have to start doing is understanding um, what's going on before it starts getting in here. So even with these measures in place, dismiss and malinformation still took place this Canadian election and are continuing now, meaning that the people responsible aren't tackling the full problem. 
Like John says, this is a full spectrum problem requiring a full spectrum solution, which the Integrity Task Force and Global Integrity Pledge are just the beginning of. So yes, it certainly is complicated, but we as voting citizens and those living in a democratic society need to absolutely care about the integrity of an election and political discourse in general. Hopefully it helps for you to learn how dismiss and malinformation can be used, so that next time you're scrolling on TikTok, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Reddit, Instagram, you'll be able to see when dismiss or malinformation is infecting your feed.